you. Let me move on to our third speaker, which is Jennifer Ryzen from Duke University. And uh, Jennifer has actually, Jen, Jen has had a really sort of very significant role in the center actually, because she reminded me that uh, she was one of the five graduate students that went uh, to with 10 professors to NSF to, to defend uh, this, this grant actually. And I remember from that meeting how the um, NSF program officers mentioned the, the real enthusiasm the students had. They were sort of really impressed, far more impressed with the students than they were with the professors. So, so Jen, we owe you a lot for, for the center <laughs> in, its, in its first place. So, so, so Jen uh, did, did her PhD with uh, Brian Stoltz. Uh, before he became a member of the center, so far less interesting than it's been recent now. Uh, so with Brian Stokes, and, and then afterwards uh, went to do a, a, a postdoc with Justin Dubois. And again, uh, uh, Jen was a very active member of the center. I think she went to at least three, I think, of the annual meetings. Um, and uh, then after finishing, with, uh, she started her independent career at Duke University, and we're very much looking forward uh, to your presentation. Our title is Using Substrate Geometry to Control the Site of CH Functionalization Reactions. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've been asked to comment on the influence of the, the CH Functionalization Center on our careers. So I'm gonna start with what somebody sent me in an email a couple of days ago saying, which is being an assistant professor, you need quick wins, papers, publicity, and grants, um, which is something I've heard a number of times, usually less enthusiastically than that. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I have to thank CCHF for, for a number of things. One is um, they've very intentionally gone about publicizing the research in this area, um, not only for me, but obviously for others, both in terms of inviting students in to learn about what CH functionalization is through their open forum, and in terms of inviting experts from around the world to present. Um, they've contributed strongly to publicity, but of course, publicity is nothing without a message. And so I would also say that most of my research has been inspired by research pioneered in the CH Functionalization Center or by chemists who are now members of that center, or at least a lot of it has. Um, now, I was a CCHF affiliate back in the day, 2010 is when I started as an affiliate and when I think about what's happened in the field since 2010, it's really amazing. The difference is stark. Uh, when we started, I was lucky to work with Justin Dubois as a postdoc fellow in his lab and was thinking about strategies to transform tertiary CH centers to replace them in intermolecular reactions that were selective enough to be useful with uh, CN bonds. And part of the way that the center played into this technology was by figuring out how to help get it to be adopted relatively quickly. So Momo Visaki and Stephen Lathrop had access to this technology well before it was published. And shortly after we disclosed it, they were able to disclose a way in which it had impacted their total synthesis. So, so these types of effects, which may not be well tracked are incredibly meaningful. And to this day, this remains something I'm both grateful for and proud of. But there are also obviously formal collaborations. And at the time, Dick Zare was not yet a center member, but my first real center focused collaboration taught me about doing chemistry with fewer boundaries. So rather than identifying simply as a methodology focused chemist or a total synthesis focused chemist, actually taking a step back and saying, well, I can learn enough about these other areas when working with experts. And this collaboration, which was obviously in or with Dick Zare's lab, really led to me spending a lot of time with Richard Perry, who's now 
at Nova Southeastern University as a professor and thinking about how we could get at the mechanism of these types of amination reactions. And in the literature for 30 years, there had been this postulated intermediate, a rhodium nitronoid, with no direct evidence of this intermediate appearing because it was fleeting. And at the same time, Dick Zare's lab was thinking about how to take mass spectrometry and specifically desorption electrospray ionization mass spectrometry and use it to detect fleeting reaction intermediates. And so we were able to work with them, basically having a stream of reagents squirted at, uh, at a catalyst structure in order to create little micro droplets that would come off of the surface, basically as mini reaction vessels that could then allow for mass spectrometry detection. And in this project, the first evidence of a rhodium nitronoid that was, that was direct evidence uh, came out of this project. So that tells you a lot about where the center was then and where it is now because of how much these technologies have evolved. But it was the beginning of breaking down the boundaries within chemistry for me. And I was lucky to go on from that collaboration and work with a lot of really wonderful chemists on a number of other missions. The grand goal of the center is obviously to be able to functionalize any CH bond in a molecule even as complex as this one, ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic agent. And in this case, I'm just showing replacing a carbon-hydrogen bond at C24 with a carbon-oxygen bond, because of course that's something that P450s do in nature. And the goal in my lab is to contribute to this grand goal and specifically to think about how we can, we can carry out radical mediated processes that allow for directed functionalization. So if you look at the state of the art just before we started being effective in this area, it was 2016 before we started being effective in this area. If you were trying to take an alcohol and achieve functionalization at any of these CH bonds in a simple alkyl chain. There were technologies that were directed and radical mediated to affect delta functionalization. And there were innately selective reactions that could be used to primarily engage a more distal center, a secondary or a tertiary center, whatever CH bond is relatively weak and distal to this inductively electron withdrawing group, which of course, is going to deactivate the closer CH bonds to abstraction. So two sites were available for functionalization in any sorts of processes. And a lot of other sites simply couldn't be accessed using radical mediated processes. And that's where we started to contribute. We started to think about how you can take an alcohol or an alcohol derivative and pursue gamma functionalization. And we wanted this to be broadly relevant so that you could use one technology in, in variations on it in order to replace a number of CH bonds with a variety of groups. Of course, in addition to alcohol derivatives, we were also thinking about amine derivatives. And so I'm gonna to touch on both of these briefly, but to give you the context, the central hypothesis of all of this research was that a sulfamic acid analog, so something like this sulfamate ester, could be used to favor an unusual transition state. What do I mean? Well, in this case, what I'm showing is you have a sulfamate ester that's N-chlorinated. In the presence of light, that weak NCL bond will be homolyzed to form a nitrogen-centered radical. That nitrogen-centered radical, based on our hypothesis, would be poised to go through a seven-membered ring transition state, a kinetically favored seven-membered ring transition state to form a carbon-centered radical. And this is the unusual step. The idea was that these elongated sulfur oxygen and sulfur nitrogen bonds would favor a larger transition state than was accessible in most reactions. Most reactions go through kinetically favorable six membered ring transition states. And so we thought that by trapping this carbon-centered radical, 
we would be able to get a sense of the position selectivity in this transformation and whether the hypothesis was correct. I'm not going into the background of this, um, but suffice it to say, interests in Justin Dubois' lab had a huge impact on the way we were thinking about this project. So what's innovative about this? Well, in the 135 year history of related reactions, there had been no general strategy to be able to shift the position selectivity of this CH abstraction event. And we were proposing one. We were proposing that we could disfavor the typical six membered ring transition state and favor a seven membered ring transition state. And not only that, that we would be able to do so with the level of exquisite selectivity needed to make this useful. Fast forward to today. Now, there are technologies that do allow for selective functionalization at all of these positions, albeit to varying extents. And there have been a lot of contributions in these areas. When we were looking at this hypothesis, we were able to demonstrate that chlorination was a viable process just in the presence of light and solvent. And we used that to make an argument that, that this transition state was actually um, viable. So to see those, feel free to go to Angevant. Since then, we've demonstrated internally that fluorination and bromination processes are, are feasible. Those are, of course, unpublished results. And of course, that group transfer processes can also be affected. And indeed, that all of these types of reactions can be viable with more complex systems. And not merely viable, but that the complex system can in, in, uh, engender. <laughs> Uh, diastereo selectivity in the process. I want to make a note though. These early efforts relied on pre installation of the functional group that would ultimately be bound to carbon. And that's obviously not desirable if you want these to be really synthetically useful processes. So you could envision taking a sulfamate ester and saving a step, but also allowing for variety by using it directly with light and a photosensitizer or a photocatalyst or an, uh, an electrochemical approach in order to form that same nitrogen-centered radical intermediate. This would divorce formation of the nitrogen-centered radical from the trapping process, which after going from a nitrogen-centered radical to a carbon-centered radical would allow for introduction of a lot more variety and interception of a lot of other types of technologies. And we've demonstrated that photocatalyst-mediated processes, specifically Gizeh reactions, are viable and do tolerate electron-rich aromatic rings, um, as well as a, a number of other functional groups that wouldn't be tolerated if we had to pre-install functionality. Um, and in unpublished work, we've also thought about how to intercept other types of processes, moving toward a more catalyst-controlled approach. Um, or a more electrochemically mediated approach. So at this point in time, where we are internally within the group is that we have uh, the ability to take an alcohol in sort of three synthetic operations, possibly two steps, convert it into a functionalized alcohol, or in fact, a functionalized moiety where we've replaced this alcohol with something else. Ultimately, that's pretty cool. But if you take a step back and start to think about the original hypothesis, you'd really like to be able to have complementary technologies where you're able to get away from pre-installation of a sulfamate ester so that with more complex molecules that are ivermectin-like, you can use the sulfamate ester because its selective installation will be helpful. And with simpler alkyl chains, you can avoid it. And our first step toward thinking about that is really asking the question of how this sulfamate ester induces position selectivity. But you can't ask that question if all you have is an exquisitely selective approach. And as I mentioned, our sulfamate esters are exquisitely selective in terms of the positioning of functionality. Fortunately, amines are capable 
of, or amine derivatives, i.e. sulfamides, are capable of inducing similar selectivity, but with some predictable erosion in that selectivity. So what do I mean? We have a sulfamide that's N-chlorinated here as a substrate, and in the presence of light, and you can use a couple different solvents, the CH center that is gamma disposed reacts, ultimately furnishing a chlorinated product. You'll notice in this molecule, we have our electron withdrawing group and a more distal tertiary CH center that is not reactive under these conditions. So that should be our first clue that we should be capable of overcoming innately selective processes. In this case, the reaction's effective at primary centers, secondary centers, tertiary centers, and even when you're thinking about amino alcohol or amino acid derivatives. But there's a catch. And this is actually the coolest thing about the method, the catch. It usually is. The catch is our N-chlorinated sulfamide S or our N-chlorinated sulfamide, when we use a simple pentyl chain, furnishes a mixture of products that are incredibly difficult to separate. And what we wanted was to be able to claim that this more distally functionalized product arose from an unguided CH functionalization process. But we realized that there was another possibility, that our N-chlorinated sulfamide could proceed through an eight-membered ring transition state in principle. Now, this seemed unlikely because eight-membered ring transition states should be kinetically disfavored if we're just using traditional thinking. And that eight-membered transition state would give way to the same product that we're observing. So either of these could have been operative. So we took a step back and to figure out what was going on so we could make our claim, the claim we were certain would be that unguided CH abstraction was a potential problem in these reactions. And we decided that the simplest way to get a clear readout of this process was to use an alkyl chain that was one methylene unit longer. In that case, substrate guided 1,6 hydrogen atom transfer through a seven membered ring transition state would give us gamma chlorinated product. An eight membered ring transition state would furnish delta chlorinated product and an unguided CH abstraction process would furnish this more distally functionalized product. And we were um, shocked and a little bit disappointed when we analyzed the results of this process and determined that once again, we were only detecting gamma and delta functionalized products. This told us that our nitrogen-centered radical was likely proceeding through a seven-member transition state in competition with an eight-member transition state, which is a little bit wild if you think about it. So then we could take a step back and try to identify some of the factors that were allowing for this erosion in selectivity. In this case, I've shown those first two compounds we've talked about here. And now if you put a more distal electron withdrawing group, you can shut down delta functionalization. Or if you put a weaker CH bond, now you see higher levels of delta functionalization. So that's predictable. What happens if you're thinking about this internal nitrogen and varying substituents thereon? The more electron deficient in the internal nitrogen is, the more 1,6 hydrogen atom transfer is favored, i.e. the more electron deficient internal nitrogen substituent does not furnish detectable quantities of delta chlorinated product. Now that's wild as well, because it's the opposite of what you would expect if this were a process proceeding through um, just based on the electron density in that alkyl chain. You would expect that a more electron deficient sulfamide would favor delta functionalization. And that's not what we observe. And you can combine these effects in order to actually generate um, competitive quantities of delta and gamma functionalized products where we can start to think about transition state energies based on product distributions. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. But first I wanna show you one more effect, namely 
the smaller, the more electron deficient the group is on this terminal nitrogen, the more the delta functionalized product is favored. And that's even more evident when you start to combine these effects and can finally furnish delta functionalized product as the dominant product using sulfamid directing groups. So what do I mean when I say that we can start to think about transition state energies? Well, if you have a product distribution, presumably your gamma functionalized product will come from reaction of this nitrogen centered radical through a seven membered ring transition state to form that product. And since this is a kinetically guided process, your delta functionalized product should emerge through an eight membered transition state furnishing this product. These are not reversible processes. So your product distribution should tell you about the relative energies of these two transition states. Now, I'm a huge fan of computational models, but I'm mostly a fan of them when there's experimental evidence that they can be related to, because it, otherwise I don't trust them. <laughs> um, that's, that's just my reality. Uh, hopefully someday I'll become sophisticated enough to be able to point at the reasons I don't trust them. In this case, we have that data and you can start to think about your sulfamid with your nitrogen centered radical and the associated seven membered ring transition state and the resultant gamma functionalized radical. And you can computationally predict transition states through an eight membered ring and compare the relative transition state energies. In this case, of course, computationally, uh, the seven membered ring transition state is favored significantly. And that's also true experimentally, where this is uh, an upper bound for the extent to which it's favored. And you can in fact go through those calculations for a whole range of sulfamids. Here I'm just showing the parent sulfamid rather than the product and the associated experimental outcomes where the bottom compound results in once functionalized, uh, predominantly delta functionalized product and the top compound results in predominantly gamma functionalized product. These are ordered values. And so what you would expect if qualitatively the computations are aligned with these values is that you would see the same ordering qualitatively, but we don't. And we don't across a couple uh, basis set functional combinations. Now, in fairness, these are what one might call naive DFT calculations. These are the best first order of approximation basis functional set combinations for radical mediated transition state calculations. And so when we look at this, there are a couple things that come out of it for us. One, we definitely need a collaborator, <laughs> right? The Center for CH Functionalization tells you many things. One is you can learn how to do anything you want. And two is when you don't know what you're doing, find someone who does. So thanks for that. Uh, so definitely need a collaborator, that's one. Two, um, at least the way that we're using basis set and functional combinations to computationally predict outcomes in radical mediated reactions. And I mean, we as a community, we have to be a little bit more careful, some of, some of those of us who are using naive DFT calculations. Three, um, these basis set functional combinations have been benchmarked against really simple reactions, reactions where H2 splits to H dot times two, right? So imagining that they can handle such complex systems as these is really radical. And I would say, these experiments should serve as great benchmarks, great benchmarks for future computational system developments. And then lesson number four, somewhere in here, we should be able to learn about why a particular site is favored in terms of directed reactions. And maybe then, we can not only take advantage of these directed processes that are um, based on amine derivatives and alcohol derivatives, 
But maybe then we can get away from these directing groups altogether and be able to have truly catalyst driven processes in these radical approaches. I've been lucky to work with incredible chemists who are now doing everything they want and to rely on um, a lab legacy from our initial postdoc and undergrads. Our lab looks a lot more like this these days uh, and everyone in it um, has been contributing to some of the coolest projects that I couldn't talk about here. So I'm grateful to them, to our analytical support, to collaborators, to the NIH who funds these investigations, as well as to other funding agencies without whom we would be unable to carry out really cool research. Um, and of course, because my students are ambitious, they've gone out and gotten fellowships. So I'm grateful to those agencies as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I will be happy to take any questions. I would also like to mention, thank you for training me. Um, perhaps way better than you even imagine. Thanks very much, Jen. Lovely talk.